Hi, and welcome back to the Chemistry Podcasts. Uh, this podcast will look at ionization energy. Uh, we'll define what it means, and then we'll have a look at some trends and how we can explain those trends. So first of all, the definition. If it's an energy, obviously uh, we're looking at how much energy is required to do something. If it's ionization energy, uh, it, it's how much energy is required to make an atom become an ion. But we need to be pretty precise in our definition. So the first ionization energy is defined as the energy required to remove the most loosely held electron from one mole of gaseous atoms. Of course that will produce one mole of gaseous ions, each with a charge of plus one. Now that's a pretty wordy definition. It's probably easier to see in the symbolic terms that shows you know one mole of gaseous atoms goes to one mole of gaseous ions. And the ionization energy is the energy required for that change to occur. Now the values of ionization energies, first ionization energies, range from 381 kilojoules per mole to 2370 kilojoules per mole. A question I often pose to my classes is which element do you think has the highest first ionization energy? And invariably students say hydrogen initially and then almost instantly change their mind to helium. So I'm hoping that's the uh, answer you came up with to that question because in fact helium does have the highest first ionization energy. This graphical representation shows the first 20 elements. You can see a number of trends there and we're going to try and explain those. Uh, we're also going to try and look at what factors will influence the, ionize the value of the ionization energy. So first of all, the charge on the nucleus is really quite important because to remove an electron, you're actually overcoming the electrostatic attraction of the electron, which is negatively charged, with the nucleus, which is positively charged. So the bigger the nuclear charge, the more positive the nucleus is, the more strongly an electron will be held. Other factors will include things like the distance the electron is from the nucleus. We've already seen when we're talking about principal energy levels, that the higher the principal energy level, the further away an electron is from the nucleus. Now that attraction between the electron and the nucleus falls up very rapidly with distance. So an electron in a lower principal energy level will require a lot more energy to remove it than an electron in a higher principal energy level. Another factor is the number of electrons between those outer electrons and the nucleus. Uh, you'll often read that those electrons between the outer electron and the nucleus screen or shield the outer electrons. But in fact it's more that they, as well as the attraction between the outer electron and the nucleus, those inner electrons are actually providing a repulsive force which sort of counteracts the attraction. Another factor is uh, whether the electron is on its own in an orbital or it's paired with another electron. Two electrons in the same orbital will experience a little bit of repulsion from each other and that can offset again that attraction of the electron with the nucleus. So those paired electrons are removed a little bit more easily than you might expect but we'll look at that later on. Here's a specific example of two atoms, two consecutive atoms in the periodic table. Helium, with two protons and two electrons, has its two electrons in the ground state in principal energy level 1. Lithium, three protons, three electrons, has its three electrons, two in principal energy level 1 and one in principal energy level 2. And when you look at the values of the ionization energies, you can see it is far easier, almost one quarter the value in lithium than it is in helium. This is because lithium's outer electron is at a higher principal energy level, it's further away from the nucleus, so the distance comes into play, and also has two electrons between it and the nucleus. So those factors come into play and they counteract the fact that lithium has a more positive nucleus than does helium. When we look at trends across a period, and this uh, graphic shows the second period elements in brown and the third period elements in green, you can see that the general trend is for the ionization energy to get larger and larger as you go across a period. Let's think why that would be. As you go across a period, the nuclear charge will increase. And also as you go across a period, the outer electrons are being added to the same principal energy level. So they're approximately the same distance from the nucleus. So the only factor that's coming into play there 
there's no extra electron shielding. Um, they're at about the same distance. The only factor that's really influencing here is the fact that the nuclear charge is getting more positive. But you'll see a few little anomalies in that trend. If you look at, um, say for example, beryllium and boron. Boron is after uh, beryllium. It has a more positive nuclear charge and yet it has a lower ionization energy. So we have to explain why that occurs. The ionization energy is about 100 kilojoules per mole less. So what happens is this. Offsetting the fact that boron has that one extra proton is the fact that its outer electron is a 2p electron rather than a 2s electron. And 2p electrons have just a slightly higher energy than the 2s. So therefore on average the electron is a little bit further away from the nucleus and in that case it is getting a little bit more shielding from those inner electrons because it is at that greater distance. Okay, so that's one little anomaly in the trend. But there is another one when you look, um, say, between nitrogen and oxygen. And again, you would expect oxygen to be a bit higher because it has a more positive uh, nuclear charge. But it is actually lower. So let's see if we can explain that. There's the actual values. It's only a little bit lower, but it is lower. Both nitrogen and oxygen have the same screening because their outer electrons are both going into 2p orbitals. There's no extra electrons uh, between those outer electrons and the nucleus. The only difference is that oxygen's electron comes from a paired uh, pair of electrons in the 2p x orbital. So there's a little bit of repulsion between those paired electrons there. So that makes it just a slightly bit more easier to remove. Okay, if we look at uh, trends when you go down a group, and you can see the general trend is to uh, reduce an ionization energy as you go down a group. Why would that be? The reason would be that the electrons are going to be further away from the nucleus. And not only are they further away, so distance comes into play, but being at a higher principal energy level, that means there's more electrons at lower principal energy levels between them and the nucleus. So you get this shielding effect occurring. If we look at transition metals, and I, I keep saying that this year in the course we're only looking at the first 20 elements, but I, I think it is, is reasonable to look at the transition elements. You can see that every one of its uh, the transition metals loses its elec electron, outer electron, from the 4s orbital. So because it's coming from the same distance away, there'll be the same shielding and all that sort of thing, the only factor that comes into play there with those transition metals is the increasing nuclear charge. And relatively, it's not a, a, a large increase when you, you know, you're getting to, say, 26 protons compared to 25 protons. So there's just a very slight increase in ionization energies as you go across the transition metals.